كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر وتؤمنون بالله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد Praise Allah, we seek His assistance and we seek His forgiveness and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves and our bad deeds. Whoever Allah guides, there is none that can lead Him astray. And whoever Allah leads astray, there is no guide for Him. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is alone, He has no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is His slave and messenger. Uh, a lot of you have heard Khutbatul Haja or the words that we just started with uh, in the beginning of lectures but may not recognize, this, recognize the significance of the words that are being said and the fact that there are actually at least one companion who accepted Islam when he heard Khutbatul Haja. Now, I mean, the words that a lot of times we just say and we don't give it any meaning or when the speaker is, you, starts in the beginning and Alhamdulillah and Ahmadu and we just kind of turn off and wait for him to begin to speak. These words actually led someone to accept Islam. Does anybody know what his name is? Huh? No? Anyone else? It's a companion by the name of Dhamama ibn Tha'laba. And he was actually uh, warned by his people, don't go to Muhammad وسلم, because he's a madman and uh, perhaps he actually, someone performed magic on him or something's wrong with him. So just leave him alone. And Dhamama ibn Tha'laba, uh, he actually had some concern for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he thought that maybe I can go cure this man because he used to perform some type of ruqya uh, or, or reading over people. So he said maybe I can, I can cure uh, this madman, is what they told him. And so he went to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for that purpose actually of curing him. And when he got to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said some words to him and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiru. To the end of it. And he said, Wallahi, I've heard the speech of magicians and I've heard the speech of sorcerers and I've heard the speech of the, the kuhan, which is uh, fortune tellers. He said, and this speech here can come from none other than Allah Azza wa It has to be Revelation. It has to have come from the Creator and he accepted Islam. He stuck out his hand, he shook the hand of the Prophet as a form of bay'ah or pledging allegiance. And so when you hear these words at the beginning of a, of a lecture, they, they should mean something to you. This is not the time right now to talk about the meaning of Khutbatul Haja, but maybe uh, at some point uh, in the future, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, before beginning the lecture, I also think it's important that we recognize that this is a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oftentimes, myself, other brothers, we speak about the distractions of life. I need the everyday distractions that people, and, and I don't believe 
that there is a time in history that compares to this time in terms of distractions? I don't think so. I mean, even not that long ago, if you wanted to be entertained, you had to go out the house to go to the movies or to a, to a play or whatever the situation may be. And then the TVs came into the house. And so a person is able to watch whatever he wants and entertain himself and forget about life or whatever the situation may be right there in the comfort of his own home. With smartphones and tabs and everything else, everywhere a person goes, they can entertain themselves. Play games on the phone, internet, whatever the situation may be, watch movies, listen to whatever they listen to, 24 seven distraction. If that is not from shaitan, and if a person doesn't just take a step back and think, what do I do more every day? Read the news or read the Quran? What do I do every day more? Play games or read the Quran? I mean, subhanAllah, the book that Allah sent down as the final guidance for mankind, and Danny, we kind of just push it to the side. So the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us to be here right now, we have to recognize that as a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thank Him for that because blessings increase with thanks and they decrease with kufran, denying them and not recognizing the fact that it is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day uh, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri uh, radiallahu an, he said that one day Mu'awiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiallahu anhuma uh, went to the masjid and he saw some people sitting in a circle fi halqa fi masjid and he said ma ajlasakum what is it why are you guys sitting here and they said jalasna nadhkurullah so we've sit, we're sitting here to remember Allah, dhikrullah. So Muawiyah radiallahu anh, said to them, Allahi, ma ajlasakum illa dak? By Allah, there's nothing that you ha have sat down for except for that, like you're sitting in the masjid just to remember Allah Azza wa Jalla. There's nothing else, no dunya benefit or anything like that. They said, Wallahi, ma ajlasana illa dak. By Allah, we have only sat down to remember Allah. So then Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu said to them, أَمَا إِنِّي لَمْ أَسْتَحْلِفْكُمْ تُهْمَةً لَكُمْ He said, I have not uh, asked you to swear by Allah or asked you to make an oath because I don't believe you. Okay, I'm not asking you to swear by Allah because I'm accusing you of lying. He said, but one time, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam خَرَجَ عَلَى قَوْمٍ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ وَهُمْ فِي حلقة. He said, but one time the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went out to the masjid and he saw people gathered and he asked them, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked them مَا أَجْلَسَكُمْ What is it that has caused you to sit here and to gather? They said, جَلَسْنَا نَذْكُرُ اللَّهِ وَنَحْمَدُهُ عَلَى مَا هَدَانَا لِلْإِسْلَامِ وَمَنَّا بِهِ عَلَيْنَا They said that we have sat here or we are sitting here remembering Allah and praising Him for having guided us to, his, to Islam and the favor of Islam upon us or the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us by guiding us to Islam. And this... As a side note, it indicates that when they talk about dhikrullah, it's not doesn't mean that they're sitting around in a circle saying Allah, 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 or something like that. Look, they're remembering Allah Azza wa Jal, His favors, talking about Allah Azza wa Jal, reminding one another of Islam. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Allahi ma ajlasakum illa dhak. Nothing has caused you to sit here except for that, to remembering Allah. I said, Wallahi, ma ajlasana illa dhak. 
by Allah, we have only sent for this, for this reason, to remember Allah. So the Prophet Sallallahu said to them, أَمَا إِنِّي لَمْ أَسْأَلْكُمْ أَمَا إِنِّي لَمْ أَسْتَحْلِفْكُمْ تُهْمَةً لَكُمْ وَلَكِنْ أَتَانِي جِبْرِيلٌ وَأَخْبَرَنِي أَنَّ اللَّهَ يُبَاهِ بِكُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ He said, the Prophet Sallallahu said to them, I'm not, didn't ask you to swear by Allah or to make an oath because I don't believe you or because I'm accusing you but Jibril came to me and he told me that Allah Azza wa Jal brags about you all to the malaik to the angels it's collected by an Imam Muslim in his Sahih and it reminds me of something else and I'm sorry that to not get on the topic immediately, but I, I think that it's critical that we recognize the importance of these type of gatherings to remember Allah Azza wa Jal and to increase in knowledge. You know, the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal, it may seem strange that Allah would mention people who gather to the angels, but if you think about the first story in the Quran, what is the first story in the Quran? If you open up Mus'haf, huh? Again? Adam and Eve? Tayyib, before Eve. Just Adam. Yes, exactly. So, it, the first story in the Quran, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي إِنِّي جَاعِنُ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً قَالُوا وَتَجَعَلُوا فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَاءِ To the end of it. It's, it's the story of the creation of Adam. And Allah Azza wa Jal is talking to the angels and telling them that he's going to create a khalifa in the earth. And they said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're going to create someone who yufsidu fiya is going to cause corruption in, in the lands and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, inni ish a'lamu ma la ta'lamu. I know what you don't know. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning his ilm. Notice this, he's mentioning his knowledge. What is the virtue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to Adam over the angels? Right there in the beginning of the surah. وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا And so Allah taught Adam the names of everything. ثُمَّ عَرَضَهُمْ عَلَى الْمَلَائِكَةِ And then he showed these things to the angels, okay, that he taught Adam the names of. And he told the angels to tell me what these things are. And kuntum sadiqeen, if, if it is that you are truthful about what you said about Adam, to the end of it. The scholars of tafsir mentioned that the fadl or the virtue that was given to Adam over the angels in that particular situation was ilm, was knowledge. And so when the people come together to get a piece of that knowledge and to remind, to remind themselves of that knowledge, then Allah mentions them to the angels. It's almost as a reminder to the angels that look, these were created with that virtue and they came together for that purpose. And so Allah Azzawajal mentions them to the, to the angels as it comes in another hadith uh, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Majtama'akum <laughs> وحفتهم الملائكة وغشيتهم الرحمة وذكرهم الله في من عنده. See, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that there is not a people who gather in one of the houses of Allah, yet luna kitab Allah, reciting the book of Allah and studying it amongst themselves, except that there is a tranquility that comes down, sakina that comes down, and that they are encompassed by the angels and so we are in the house of Allah for the purpose of studying the book of Allah and the revelation and so we should believe it shouldn't be something that's like a far off theological concept we should believe that the angels are surrounding this gathering that we're having right now because we believe in the unseen وَغَشِيَتْهُمَ الرَّحْمَةِ and, and Rahmah 
Allah Azawajal's mercy penetrates the entire gathering. To the point that many of the scholars mentioned in the explanation of this hadith, that just by sitting in the circles of knowledge, it is a means of the sins being forgiven. Because there's no way that rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could penetrate a gathering and leave people without having some of their sins forgiven. وَذَّكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مِنْ عِنْدَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them to those who are close to him, the angels. And consider that, consider what that means because to bring the meaning a little closer, if someone does something that is praiseworthy, they didn't do it for the people to praise them, they did it for Allah Azza wa Jalla. But they did something that was good. They did something that was good. And someone else goes and they, for example, they post it on a website or maybe it's on front page of the newspaper and people are calling around saying, MashaAllah, did you hear about Fulan's accomplishment, for example, whatever the situation may be, or something that he did. Person feels good that they are being mentioned by the people in a good light. People are saying good things about them. And, you, and they feel good about that. And all of you have had that experience, whether it's for your children, whether it's for yourself. But you know that when people mention you in a good light, it, it feels good. It's like, if Allah is with them, mentions you in a good light to the malaika, then is there anything that's greater than that? So, brothers and sisters in Islam, let us be diligent in seeking the knowledge of Islam. It's not something that we should take lightly. And we shouldn't expect that when you come for a gathering of knowledge, with all of the blessings that we talked about, the, the tranquility and the, and the mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah azza wa jal mentioning you and bragging to the angels and مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever Allah wants good for, he gives them fiqh of the religion. You should not come to these type of gatherings with all of that reward expecting to be entertained or, or expecting the whole thing to be something that's lighthearted. You know, Imam Malik, Rahimahullah Ta'ala was asked a question and he said, La adri, I don't know. When he was asked, I don't know the answer to the question. So the person said, It's a mas'ala khafifa, was the word he used. It's, it's a lightweight issue. And he met Malik got upset. And he said, There is no such thing as knowledge that is khafif, that is light. There's no lightweight issues. Allah Azza wa Jal said, we are going to send down to you a heavy statement. There are no lightweight issues. So again, we should come to these type of gatherings uh, not expecting that we're going to be entertained, but expecting to learn something that we can take and implement in our religion. Uh, The topic that I've been asked to speak about tonight uh, is a topic that's difficult to speak about. And even the scholars have a very difficult time defining exactly what this topic is. And you all know that the topic is a tawakkul, all right, which was translated as trust in Allah. I didn't translate it as that. I'm going to leave it as tawakkul for right now until we get to uh, the definition that has been offered by uh, many of the scholars. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, commands us with a tawakkul in many ayat in the Quran. And as you know, uh, the forms of worship are not just ritual things or, or, or what may appear on the outside. For example, salat. Someone can see you make salat. Or someone can see you make hajj, for example. There are other ibadat that are qalbiya, okay? They are from the heart. Now, the manifestations will be on the limbs, but those acts of worship, they start in the heart. And these are from the most important acts 
of worship. Those ibadat or those acts of worship that are, that are from the heart. And this is why Shaykh al-Islam and Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala when talking about tawakkul, I'm going to read exactly what he said. He said, وَقَدْ أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِالتَّوَكُّلِ فِي غَيْرِ آيَةٍ أَعْظَمَ مِمَّا أَمَرَ بِالْوُدُوءِ وَالْغُسْلِ مِنَ الْجَنَابَةِ He said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us with tawakkul in many ayat in the Quran, more so than he commanded us with making wudu or making ghusl from janaba, which is the uh <laughs> Al Janaba is the, the, the state of impurity, the greater state of impurity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as important as wudu is, and as important as making ghusl is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us in the Quran with tawakkul more than he commanded with al wudu and ghusl. So I'm going to mention some of these ayat, and uh, hopefully you'll follow along inshallah ta'ala to see the importance of tawakkul. The, the first ayat, is in Ali Imran when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضًّا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْفَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ فَاعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَهْ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَوَكِّلِينَ طيب in this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so by the mercy of Allah, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ يعني You were soft with them. And if you were harsh and you were rough, they would have ran away from you. يعني meaning the companions. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to pardon them and to ask Allah to forgive them. وَشَاوِرُهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ and seek their advice in different affairs. After seeking their consultation, فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ Once you come to a conclusion, a firm conclusion on what it is that you want to do, put your tawakkul in Allah. فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Then put your tawakkul in Allah. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُحِبُّ Al-Mutawakkilin. Indeed, Allah loves those who are those who have tawakkul. Al-Mutawakkilin. The next ayah, right after that, Subhanallah. Th think about the connection between the two ayahs. In yansurkum Allah, fala ghalib lakum. If Allah aids you, then there is no one that can defeat you. No one. If Allah aids you, there is no one that can defeat you. It doesn't matter what they bring. It doesn't matter if the enemies from the East and the West come together with everything that they have. Numbers and preparation. <inaudible> Notice the relationship between this and tawakkul. <inaudible> but if Allah leaves you, يَخْذُلْكُمْ And uh, the, 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 the Arabs in general, they have different ways that they explain الْخُذْلَانِ But basically what it means is that uh, at the time of need, someone just leaves you. They don't, they don't help you at the time of need. So if, if Allah does not help you at your time of need, then who is it that can help you? وَإِنْ يَخْذُلْكُمْ فَمَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَنْصُرُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ Who is it that can help you after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left you to yourself? What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say after that? وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكِّلْ وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكِّلْ الْمُتَوَكِّلُونَ So, upon Allah, let those who have tawakkul put their tawakkul. And I'm leaving it as tawakkul for a reason. Uh, but I want you to think about this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلْ And in Allah, put your tawakkul. Or upon Allah, put your tawakkul. Is there a difference between 
I'll, I'll use English terms like they have on the, on the dollar bills. Is there a difference between in God we trust and we trust in God? Tell you, what's the difference? Is there a di- huh? Go ahead. Tell you, exclusivity, is that how they say it in English? Like, <laughs> all right. Do, do you know the difference? Before we take a, something that you may be more familiar with. Do you know the difference in Fatiha? You, in, in, in Fatiha, you say, Iyaka na'budu, right? Wa Iyaka nasta'in. Is there a difference between that and saying, na'buduka wa nasta'inu bik? Right? Uh, mm. No, 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 without a doubt, without a doubt. But, but that's, that's beside the point of, of understanding the words that, that, that are being used in this ayah. So, Abu Musa, Jazallah khairan, there's this concept of exclusivity. What, what does that mean, though? What it means is that when you put the, the object before the verb, okay, then what it means is that the verb is exclusively for that, that object. Or if you use, for example, in this case, a prepositional phrase that would normally come later in the sentence, and you move it to the beginning, then at that point it becomes exclusive for that particular thing. So to use Fatiha and then go back to this, if, if you say, for example, na'buduka, we worship you, right? You could say we worship you and we worship some other things, okay? That would work from a, from a linguistic perspective. But if you say iyaka na'budu, it is you we worship, then the meaning of that is that it is you alone that we worship, and that's probably why you see in a lot of translations they put alone in parentheses or maybe they just put alone. So likewise here, Allah says, وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكِّلُ Al-mutawakkilun. Upon Allah, put your tawakkul. Meaning that you cannot put tawakkul upon anyone else. And, and the reason why this is an interesting point is because if we translate tawakkul as trust, right? Is it okay for you to then say, I trust you? Do you, you get the point or you don't get it? Because we can only, if we use it, if we say that tawakkul is trust, and we can only trust in Allah is it okay for us to say to someone else, I trust you? Well, here we get another point. Is there a difference between trusting in something and trusting something? But that's, I, 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 it, it, and it really isn't linguistic gymnastics. I, I, I don't want you to think about it like that because we have to also, just like we purify our hearts, and we purify our worship for Allah we have to make sure that the words that we use also are correct. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this in, in many different places. We don't have a, enough time to, to go into all of it right now. Uh, for the sake of time, Allah mentions in some other ayat, we just go through them very quickly inshaAllah ta'ala. He says, وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى الْحَيِّ الَّذِي لَا يَمُوتِ And put your tawakkul upon or in the one who is hayy, who is alive and who will not die. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى الْعَزِيزِ الرَّحِيمِ And put your trust in the one who is Al-Aziz, Almighty, Al-Rahim, the Merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ كُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِمَانًا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ So uh, the believers are only those who if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned then their hearts tremble out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and out of the, the hope in Him. وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِمَانًا And when they hear His verses recited it increases them and their iman and upon their Lord, they put their tawakkul. And many other ayat. The Prophet ﷺ says in a hadith which is considered to be one of the most important uh, a hadith as it relates to a tawakkul. 
and understanding what tawakkul means. Uh, the hadith of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that the, he heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, لو أنكم كنتم توكلون على الله حق التوكل لرزقتم كما ترزق الطير If you were to put your trust or your tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the way that you should you would be provided for the same way that birds are provided for تغدو خماصا وتروح بطانا They go out in the morning hungry on empty stomachs and they return with full stomachs uh, Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala and commenting on this hadith he says that this hadith because some people actually use this hadith to say yeah if you just uh, put tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then don't do anything just sit around and wait for something to happen and that's their concept of tawakkul putting or relying upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala depending upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Imam Ahmad said that this hadith is not an evidence for that as a, fact, as a matter of fact it is evidence to the contrary because the birds go out in the morning for what purpose? do they stay in the nest? no, they go out on empty stomachs for what? for the purpose for the purpose of provision, looking for their provisions. And then they come back and they are upon, or they are on full stomachs. And so this hadith does not give any credence to those people who uh, say that if you put your trust upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that's enough that you should not do anything or you should not look at the, cause and effect and these type of things like that. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the causes and He created their effects. So a person should go out and seek his provisions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he should not depend upon himself or his strength or his ability or his degree or his connections or his skin color or his nationality or whatever the situation may be. He puts his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he goes out and does the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him the ability to do so if we understand these ayat that we've heard in some of these ahadith then it is important to understand how, how, how tawakkul relates to Islam and how tawakkul relates to one's iman can a person be a Muslim if he doesn't have the quality of tawakkul? What do you think? Yeah? So a person can be a Muslim but not really have tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can a person be a mu'min, a, a true believer, without having tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No. But he can be a Muslim? Tayyip, maybe. Let's listen to what Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala said about that. Uh, <clears throat> he says, uh, I'll try to just uh, go through it as, as succinctly as possible to, that, that we can get the concepts. He says that tawakkul is min lawazim al-iman wa muqtadayati. Yani, that it is from the necessary uh, aspects of iman that a person has tawakkul because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa ala allahi fatawakkalu in kuntum mu'minin upon allah put your tawakkul your trust or your dependence your reliance if you are believers meaning that meaning that if a person does not have that aspect then they cannot be a believer fajala tawakkula Shartan fil iman. So Ibn Qayyim says, so Allah in this ayah has made tawakkul a condition of iman. And so that indicates that a person who does not have tawakkul does not have iman. We got that? Is that point clear? Tayyip, what about Islam? In another ayah, وَقَالَ مُوسَى يَا قَوْمِ 
in kuntum amantum billahi fa'alayhi tawakkalu in kuntum muslimin so musa uh, all, are you familiar with the story of musa and fir'aun and the the the, the sorcerers and everything that was happening well at that particular time the uh, people of Musa they believed that Musa was 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 upon the truth they believed in Islam uh, listen to the ayah فما آمن لموسى إلا ذرية من قومه على خوف من فرعون وملئه من يفتنهم so only a few of them believed in Musa uh, because they were scared of Fir'aun they were scared of Fir'aun and his his entourage if you will they were scared that they would be persecuted by Fir'aun and his entourage وَإِنَّ فِرْعَوْنِ الْعَالَمِ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَإِنَّهُ لَمِنَ الْمُسْلِفِينَ Fir'aun is a he, he was a taghut actually okay he was someone who was proud and he was from the transgressors Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to say after that وَقَالَ مُوسَى يَا قَوْمِ so now we have this group of people who they know that Islam is the truth and I'm not talking about the Islam as in the Sharia that the Prophet Sallallahu came with but all of the Prophets were sent with Islam so they believed that Musa came with the truth but they were scared that they were going to be persecuted and so they didn't want to go with Musa for fear that they would be persecuted what is, what is that a lack of? it's a lack of tawakkul it's a lack of tawakkul and so Musa said to his people, Ya qawmi in kuntum amantum billah. Oh my people, if you truly believe in Allah, fa'alayhi tawakkalu, then put your trust in Him. Or put your tawakkul in Him. In kuntum muslimi, If in fact you are Muslims. Not if in fact you are believers, but if in fact you are Muslims. And that's why after this ayah, Ibn al-Qayyim says, فَجَعَلَ دَلِيلَ صِحَةِ الْإِسْلَامِ التوكل. So he made the indication or the evidence, the proof that someone's Islam is valid, التوكل. That a person has tawakkul upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these uh, ayat that we've listened to about tawakkul, but what does, what is tawakkul? What is tawakkul? Can anybody give me from what you've heard from what you've listened to what do you think tawakkul is just to, to even even if you don't have a full definition now nah. reliance upon allah as good to depend, on allah fully. to depend upon allah fully uh-huh by what uh-huh okay Nice. So what the brother said, we have one that says reliance upon Allah. And the brother here says dependence upon Allah as well by using the means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to do the things that you should do. But not that you believe in those means or not that you depend upon those means. You depend upon Allah as well. Good. Anyone else? Anyone else? Tay. Yes. Good, having good expectations from Allah. MashaAllah, it, <laughs> interestingly enough, each one of these definitions has been mentioned by one of the scholars at least. If not, the Sahaba themselves. Anyone else? To know that Allah has power over all things. They have mentioned that as well. Now, again, put your trust in Allah. Ayo. I didn't get the second part. I maybe I'm. You said to put the trust in Allah more than what? More than what we have. Ah. Uh. Ah. Okay. Fight. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get there. I'll get there. Inshallah. Anyone else? Fight. Yes. Uh, okay, so tawakkul has to be only for Allah as well. Nah. So you know, 
Nah. Tayyib. Good. All, all of what was said was what was generally uh, good, inshallah ta'ala. Ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala, anhuma, he, he described the tawakkul. Let me take a step back. Like I mentioned in the beginning, tawakkul, because it is a, it is a, uh, a matter of the heart, or because it is, a, it, is a, it is an action that is done by the heart, people find it very difficult to articulate the way that they feel a lot of times. Okay, so it's not, so you're not describing something that is, that you can see on the outside. And, and as a result, it becomes people's uh, way of articulating what is felt in the heart is going to vary from person to person. This is why you're gonna find that maybe no two, no two definitions given by the scholars are the same. But they still, give us a very good picture of what a tawakkul is. So instead of looking for a definition, then for tawakkul maybe we should be looking for a description as opposed to a definition because the, the, the scholars of Islam uh, and before even in, in other sciences, they say that a definition has to be jamit manit, meaning that it has to be uh, comprehensive but exclusive at the same time and I, I, I'll give you an example because I think this is important I think it's important for us to understand certain concepts uh, so if you look at if you look at for example if someone asked you what a car was and you said well it's a uh, it's a vehicle that that has uh, four wheels and a motor and a transmission Right? Tell you. Is is that a good definition for a car? I mean, is it comprehensive? Huh? A vehicle. A car. A car, you could say, is something that has four wheels or passenger vehicle, okay, that has four wheels of uh, a transmission and, a, and an engine. Every car has four wheels, right? I'm, I'm, I'm asking actually, but I, I think I'm right. Every car has four wheels and it has a transmission and, a, and, a, and an engine, right? Okay, so that would be considered to be comprehensive. I mean, it's jamming, okay? But is it exclusive? Does it prevent other things from coming into the definition? So for example, those little, uh, what do they call it? The four wheelers that people drive uh, out in the, the, the desert? ATVs or whatever, they ha what, would you consider that to be a car? No. Most people don't consider those to be car, but it does have four wheels and it has engine and it has a transmission, okay? But it's not considered to be a car. So the definition that we originally gave, it was comprehensive. It included every, but it wasn't exclusive. It didn't prevent other things from coming into the definition. And so therefore, a lot of times when we look at definitions, because it's critical, every subject that you'll study in Islam, every Islamic science is gonna start with the definition. And you need to understand why they start with these definitions so that you can understand the science that you're studying, or so that you can understand the particular topic that they're dealing with. So with tawakkul, I don't have, nor have I found a definition that I can just say is jamming Manit, meaning that it is comprehensive and exclusive at the same time. However, the definitions that we do have or the descriptions that we do have will help us to get a better concept of what tawakkul is and then how we can, what we can do to uh, attain it, inshallah ta'ala. Tayyip, Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma said that uh, tawakkul is a thiqatu billah. It is that you have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or that you have confidence in Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Hasan al-Basri, rahimahullah, was asked about tawakkul and he said, Ar-Rida anillah azza wa jal. It is to be pleased with Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Other uh, scholars say, Ara at tawakkula husn al dhani billahi azza wa jal. Like Abdul Salam said, that tawakkul is to have good expectations, to good thoughts, good opinions about Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, one of the Salaf was asked about uh, 
التوكل ما بنيت أمرك هذا من التوكل what, what have you done to develop التوكل and he says or, or what is it that you see توكل to be he said there are four things he said علمت أن رزقي لا يأكله غيري فلست أهتم له he said I know that no one else is going to be able to eat my provisions. Yani whatever is for me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one else will get that. And so I don't put a whole bunch of hum. Yani I, I, I don't become anxious over my risk. I, I don't worry about my risk, my provision, because it's going to come to me from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, وَعَلِمْتُ أَنَّ عَمَلِي لَا يَعْمَلُهُ غَيْرِي فَأَنَا مَشْغُولٌ بِهِ And I know that no one else can do my actions for me and so I'm busy doing what I have to do. I'm busy doing my actions or my, my deeds because no one else can do them for me. And I know that death is going to come to me بَغْتَ Surprising me unexpectedly. So so I am going to race death in a sense that I'm going to do the things that I need to do so that I am prepared when death comes for me. He says, and I know that I am being watched by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in everything that I do. And so I am shy of my Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how he looked at at tawakkul Al-Imam Ahmed rahimahullah said that At-tawakkulu tafweedu al-amri ilallahi jalla thana'u wa thiqatu bihi It is that you surrender your entire affair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and put your trust in Him. And there are many other definitions. The most uh, comprehensive of those definitions is a definition that is given by Abdurrahman al-Si'idi rahimahullah ta'ala who was... Uh, uh, have all of you heard of Sheikh Uthameen? Sheikh Muhammad bin Saleh Al-Uthameen, Rahimahullah. He was the Sheikh of Qasim at that time. He was the Sheikh of Al-Uthameen, Allah Yarhamu, and the Sheikh of Al-Bassam and other Mashaykh. Uh, he says that, and this will be the last definition, but try to wrap your, your, your head around this particular definition, inshallah ta'ala, uh, because it is the most comprehensive of the definitions, and then we'll talk about how we can, what we can do inshallah ta'ala to uh, gain tawakkul in our lives. As Sa'idi rahimahullah says, the reality of a tawakkul ala Allah or true dependence upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that the servant knows that Allah is in command of everything. So it starts with knowledge. Okay? And, and think about this because as we talk about how to gain tawakkul, it's, it's a process, okay? It starts with knowing that Allah Azza wa is in command of everything. And that whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to happen, wills to happen, then it's going to happen. And that whatever He does not decree will not happen. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that brings benefit and harm. And He is the one who gives and withholds. وَأَنَّهُ لَا حَوْلَ وَلَا كُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ And that there is no might or strength except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the aspect of knowledge, knowing these things. After this knowledge, he has to depend with his heart. يَعْتَمِدْ بِقَلْبِهِ عَلَى رَبِّهِ فِي جَلْبِ مَصَالِهِ دِينِهِ وَدُنْيَا وَفِي دَفْعِ الْمَضَارِ Then he has to make his heart depend upon Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala alone in getting the beneficial aspects of this deen and his dunya and in repelling any harm. And yet the ghayat al wuthuq bi rabbihi. And he has to put the utmost trust in his Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in acquiring anything it is that he wants. And with all of this, his knowledge and with his heart depending upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has to put forth effort 
fi fi'l al-asbab al-nafiya to do the beneficial means that will help him to achieve his goals and ibn rajib rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned a, a definition that was that was similar to the definition of Sa'di. Right, let's break that definition down very quickly. The definition kind of has three parts. Do you remember the three parts? Huh? I heard someone over this direction. Just one. Give me one. Tayyib, huh? Huh? Knowledge of what? This is critical. This is critical because the Prophet ﷺ taught Ibn Abbas how to have tawakkul. And so we need to get it from this definition so that we can see it in his teaching to Ibn Abbas. طيب. Anyone else? <laughs> nah. No, no, no. In this, in this, in this definition of Sa'di, the first thing is what? Knowledge. But knowledge of what? Ah, that Allah is in command of everything. And that whatever He wills, will come to pass and that whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not decreed will not happen for you. Type, that's the knowledge of what, if you want to talk about uh, Jibreel, for example, when he went to the Prophet sallallahu and he asked him about Iman, what category does that fall under? The things that we just talked about. Iman in, in what? Type, of course, the Iman bil ghayb. But what, what part? No. Huh. To know that whatever Allah wills Ah, ahsant, very good It is directly related to Al-Iman Bil-Qadr The belief in Allah's decree A person cannot have tawakkul It's impossible to have tawakkul Without having a proper belief in the Qadr And see I'm mentioning this right now because a lot of times we, we, we compartmentalize uh, Islam too much to the point that you know we don't see the connection between things. You cannot have tawakkul without having an iman bil qadr. And the stronger your iman and, and, and the qadr is, the stronger your tawakkul will be. All right, tight. So that's the first part is al ilm. The second part is the, the heart. I'timaduhu ala Allah that you, that you make your heart Truly depend upon Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala And you'll be tested You'll be tested You won't be left alone to say that you believe And not be tested There will Times will come When you will talk about A tawakkul upon Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and, and how you depend upon Allah And Allah will test you Will you buckle to whatever the situation and the circumstances may be, will you seek your rizq, your provisions from something that is haram? Huh? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test you like that. Here it is, fadl. You, you wanted more provisions or you, you're, you're, you're struggling and you need this. And so something haram is put in front of you. And some of the scholars, even though I didn't mention the definition, they said, at tawakkul is to not disobey Allah and you're, see, and you're seeking a risk And you're seeking for provisions So if a person Seeks his provisions Through means that are haram Then that indicates a lack of Tawakkul So we have that first aspect of knowledge And then we have the second aspect Of the heart being truly dependent Upon Allah Azza wa Jal And then the third aspect is To do Or to perform the beneficial means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for you and given you the faculties uh, to, to use to perform whatever deeds need to be performed. Uh, what time is the uh, the common? Three, three more minutes. Alhamdulillah. So if, if you think about these aspects, all of them are mentioned in the famous hadith of Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said uh, to Ibn Abbas, Ya Ghulam inni wa'alimuka kalimat Oh young man, oh young man I will, I'm going to teach you some words And notice that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is talking to the, a Ghulam 
Ghulam is someone who has not reached the age of puberty yet. And so he's teaching Ibn Abbas these things while he's young, instilling in him this aqidah, this belief that the Muslim should have. He says to Ibn Abbas, uh, the famous hadith, if you protect the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you. If you protect the boundaries of Allah Azza wa Jal, you will find him in front of you. Tajidhu to Jack. If you ask, then ask Allah alone. And if you are seeking assistance, then seek assistance only from Allah. And know, and know that if the whole ummah, if they all came together to benefit you with something, they will only benefit you with something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already written for you. And if they come together to harm you, they can only harm you with something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already written against you. Rufi'atil aqlam wa jaffatil suhuf. The pens have been lifted and the paper is dry. Or the, yes, the paper is dry. So, there are different aspects in this hadith. All of them go back to al-iman bil qadr and then at tawakkul and how to attain the wilaya, wilaya of Allah Azza wa Jal. Yani how to become a wali. Now, I know that this term is used very loosely and it was not used at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sahaba, but it, it is the term that we would use as a muhsin. Yani the, the shari term, the, the legislated term for that is a muhsin. Many of us, many of us have very low aspirations for ourselves. Yani we don't, you know, we, we, we just are sufficed with the very least that we can do in Islam and not striving for, for more than that. But all of that depends upon your belief in the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how you put your tawakkul in Allah azza wa jal, how that relates to at-tawheed, idha sa'alta fas'alillah, if you ask, ask Allah alone. Tawheed. If you seek assistance, then seek that assistance only from Allah Azza wa Jal. Ihfadillah. That's ibadah. To be conscious of and be mindful of the hudud of Allah Azza wa Jal, those boundaries that He sent, that He that, that He made. Tajidhu to Jah. You will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of you. You will find the protection of Allah Azza wa Jal. You will find that is the what people will call a wali what we would call Ihsan to, to the point that you worship Allah Azza wa Jal as though you see Him and even though you do not see Allah Azza wa Jal you know that He is watching over you like what can we do to gain a tawakkul if they want to call it then fadl uh, huh oh I thought it was the time Malish uh Two, two things only, inshallah. Maybe you'll we'll be able to memorize them. Two things to gain tawakkul. First is that you have to remove everyone from your heart except for Allah. And we'll talk about how to do that very quickly, inshallah. The second thing is that there are certain that you have to be constant in dua and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to make you be from the true, from people who have true tawakkul upon Him. And there are, dua, there, are, there are du'as that the Prophet ﷺ taught us to say to help us get there. Type the first aspect is removing people from your heart. Huh? Everything from your heart. There, there's, a, there's an interesting hadith. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ صَنَعَ إِلَيْكُمْ مَعْرُوفًا Whoever does something good for you, then compensate him. Whoever does something good for you, then compensate him. Okay. So again, uh, just to recap, there are two main things that we look at to gain tawakkul. Uh, the first is that the heart should not be attached to any of the creation whatsoever. In terms of attaining any good or repelling any evil 
that it has to be related to Allah or that the heart has to be attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And in the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu said, مَنْ صَنَعَ إِلَيْكُمْ مَعْرُوفًا فَكَافِئُوا فَإِنْ لَمْ تَجِدُوا مَا تُكَافِئُونَهُ فَدْعُوا لَهُ حَتَّى تَرَوْا أَنَّكُمْ قَدْ كَافَاتُمُهُ Hadith is very interesting and it has a very subtle point that needs to be recognized. The Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever does something good to you or good for you, then compensate that person for what they have done for you. And if you do not have the ability to compensate that individual, then make dua for that person until you feel that you've repaid them. Till you feel that you've repaid them. You made so much dua for them that you feel like, okay, I've repaid them because Allah is going to repay them with better than anything that you could give them anyway. Many of the scholars note that it is from Islamic etiquette that we compensate people who do good for us. But others have mentioned a very subtle point that is critical here. And that is that when someone does something good for you, your heart becomes attached to them. It's natural. Because it is a natural thing to become attached to the one who has done good to you. And so you feel this kind of connection to them or this type of attachment to them. But once you repay them, now you have cleared your heart again so that the heart is only attached to Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the extent that Islam goes to to purify the heart from attachment to other than Allah Azza wa Jal. And notice that. Notice that once and you actually probably have experienced this. When you owe someone something, when you or you feel like you owe them something, then there's a feeling that you have in your heart. And once you repay them, there's a different feeling that you have in your heart. You become back on, on equal ground. Obviously Allah is the one that has given you everything in the first place and there's no way that you can repay them And so the heart should remain with that feeling of attachment to Allah because you can never repay him For the things that he has done for you and the things that he has given you And if you don't believe what I'm saying to you, all you have to think about is your own body that you would not sell to anyone if someone needed eyes and they said I'll buy your eyes from you for 50 million you're not going to sell your eyes for twice that much or anything for that matter and Allah is the one who gave you your eyes there's no one you can repay there's no way that you can repay him for that and the heart should remain attached to Allah for that reason and there are other ways that the believer goes about making sure that his heart is only attached so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, those are things that you should ponder as you read the Qur'an. Those are things that you should ponder as you read the Qur'an because there are many ayat in the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala establishes himself as the only one that can benefit you and the only one that can prevent harm from coming to you. And so those things have to be thought about. The other thing is be mulazimat dua fi kulli matloob. And that is that you make dua for every single thing that you need. You make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you are constant in making that dua. Some of those duas, inshallah ta'ala, uh, like istikhara, for example, is not enough time to go into istikhara and what it means, but uh, many of you have heard of istikhara, which is the dua that you make before a decision. Uh, that you put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that decision that you make. And dua al-istikhara could actually use its own uh, lecture by itself to talk about the belief in qadr and to the end of it that, that is uh, existing in, or present in uh, al-istikhara. Uh, another dua, and uh, this one is, is important because the Prophet sallallahu or it was encouraged the Muslims are encouraged to say this dua every day, twice a day, in the morning and in the evening. Uh, Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Man qala idha 
أصبح وأمسى وإذا أمسى حسبي الله لا إله إلا هو عليه توكلت وهو رب العرش العظيم سبع مرات كفاه الله ما أهمه and this is collected by Abu Dawood with a authentic chain it is narrated on Abu Abu Darda but the scholars who's a companion he's but the scholars say that what he mentioned in this hadith could not have been mentioned or he could not have had this knowledge except that he got it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's what they say, meaning that it is stopped at the companion. The companion is the one that narrated it, but it is as if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it. He said, whoever says in the daytime or in the morning and in the evening, Hasbi Allah. Yani Allah is sufficient for me. La ilaha illahu. Uh, there is no deity and truth except for Him. Alayhi tawakkalt. I have put my trust in Him. Wahu Rabbul Arsh al Azim. And He is the Lord of the Great Throne. Whoever says this seven times in the day, seven times in the night, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will relieve him of everything that worries him. But you, it's, it's not just saying it. It's not just saying it as in you were speaking Chinese or Japanese or another language you don't understand. You need to understand what you're saying. When you say, Hasbi Allah, Allah is sufficient for me. And you remind yourself of that seven times, that there's no deity in truth except for Him. Alayhi tawakkalt, in Him I put my trust. And that you mention, Huwa Rabbul Arsh al Azim. What is the arsh? I mean, think, think about the creation of the, 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 the how, how magnificent the arsh is. Think about how small the earth is. Think about how small we are in relative to the earth. So all of these things are meanings that should come to our minds when we say these, these, these types of duas. But we should, we should say them as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed. Likewise, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instructed Fatima Radiallahu uh, anha to say in the morning and in the evening, Ya Hayu Ya Qayyum, bi rahmatika astaghith, aslih li sha'ni kullahu, wala takilni ila nafsi tarfata'i. This hadith is Hassan uh, or graded as a, a good hadith, Hassan hadith uh, by Shaykh al Bani, Rahimahullah, and other scholars. Ya Hay. This is the name, a name of Allah Azza wa Jal. Ya Hay, Ya Qayyum. Uh, by your mercy, I seek assistance. Rectify all of my affairs and do not leave me to myself, even for the blinking of an eye. Uh, blinking of an eye. So this is another du'a that you can learn to say in the morning, every morning, and in the evening, every evening before Maghrib, and to say it in the morning after Fajr. Likewise, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, as the Prophet sallallahu said that this is a treasure from the treasures of Jannah. It's collected by Bukhari and Muslim. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, and understand what that means, that there is no might and no strength except with Allah Azza wa Jal. So you surrender your power to the power of Allah and you recognize that everyone else is just part of Allah's creation and they have no means of harming you or no means of aiding you with other than that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already written for you. And then there's the dua of some of the Salaf like Sa'id ibn Jubair rahimahullah ta'ala who used to say frequently Allahumma inni asaluka sidqa tawakkuli alayk wa husna dhanni bik. Oh Allah, we ask you to give us, this is the dua of Sa'id ibn Jubair. Oh Allah, we ask you to give us sidq tawakkul true dependence upon you and to have good thoughts and expectations about you. Again, uh, just to end it off, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, May tawakkal ala Allahi huwa hasbu. Whoever puts their trust in Allah azza wa jal, then he will find that Allah azza wa jal is sufficient for him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah yuhibbu المتوكلين, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the people who put their trust in Him. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sufficient, 
for the one who puts their trust in him and he loves the one who puts their trust in him what station is greater than achieving the love of Allah Azza wa Jal and finding that he is sufficient for him that should be enough of an encouragement for us to learn more about tawakkul to strive to gain tawakkul and to put our tawakkul in, in Allah Azza wa Jal alone wallahu alam sallallahu alaihi wasallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad